Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. Innovators of NSD2 discovered by high throughput screening with a nucleosome substrate. Presented by Nathan Cousins, Senior Research Scientist, Biology, Division of Preclinical Innovation, National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, National Institute of Health. I'm Alexis Kraus of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labberts. Labberts is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your question into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cousins. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you for the introduction, Alexis, and welcome to the webinar. Today I'll talk about inhibitors of the human histomycine methyltransferase called NSD2 that were discovered at NCATS using quantitative high-throughput screening with a full-length wild-type enzyme and a nucleosome substrate. And I'll begin by giving you some introduction and background to the project. I'll talk about assay development and high-throughput screening that led to the identification of a number of hits. And then I'll talk about uh, different counter screens and assays used to further triage the hits we had. And I'll focus on five inhibitors that we identified and some follow-up studies that we performed I'll tell you about some of the conclusions that we have and some of the future directions we are pursuing. So this work was done at the NIH Chemical Genomics Center, which was founded in 2004 and was the first center in the Molecular Library Screening Center network. And this was part of a large NIH roadmap initiative uh, intended to bring small molecule discovery sciences to academic and government collaborators. Um, and currently we have uh, more than 200 collaborators located throughout the world. And we focus on assay development, high throughput screening, chemical informatics, and medicinal chemistry to go from targets to lead molecules. But our focus is really on unprecedented targets and rare and neglected diseases. So the mission of our center is to catalyze the generation of innovative methods and technologies that will enhance the development, testing, and implementation of interventions that tangibly improve human health across a wide range of human diseases and conditions. And my colleagues and I focus on a variety of aspects uh, throughout the discovery pipeline represented at the top of the slide uh, from the point of initial validation of a target for a potential small molecule modulator to the development of assays that can be used in high throughput screening to identify hits among large libraries of drug-like compounds. And then these compounds that show up as hits can be further optimized using medicinal chemistry to improve their selectivity, potency, and efficacies, and then used as uh, chemical probes to further understand the underlying biology or advanced into preclinical development. And we can take projects as far as phase one clinical trials through our Therapeutics for Rare and Neglected Diseases program, or TRENT. So today I'll give you an example of one such project that was in our pipeline and is. And so this involves a protein that's been associated with multiple names and diseases. And I'm actually bringing uh, studies in from multiple labs uh, throughout the slides in the stack. So I wanted to introduce all three names uh, so that you won't be confused by the different nomenclature. So one of the first names for this protein was WHSC1 due to its involvement in Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome which is due to a partial deletion from the short arm of chromosome four. And uh, this is one of the genes that's deleted. And so it was termed wolf hirschhorn syndrome candidate one. So another name for the same protein is NSD2, which I will preferentially use throughout this talk. 
and that stands for nuclear receptor binding cytomain protein 2. And it belongs to a family of histone lysine methyltransferases that are called nuclear receptor binding cytomain proteins. And as you can see, this involves NSD1, NSD2, and NSD3. And these three genes are associated with multiple gene products. And they're named uh, for their catalytic set domain that's indicated uh, in red on this slide. So this set domain is responsible for the methyltransferase activity. And they also contain a variety of domains important for molecular interactions. For instance, the proline tryptophan tryptophan proline domain is important for identification of the nucleosome substrate and docking the enzyme. So once the enzyme uh, binds to um, the nucleosome substrate, so NSC2 can utilize as a methyl donor, uh, s adenosyl L-methionine to either mono or dimethylate uh, histone 3 lysine 36. And one of the products of this reaction is s adenosyl L-homocysteine, or SAW. So I'll refer to these molecules as SAM and SAW throughout this talk. So the NSC enzymes have been implicated in cancers um, and really described to act as oncoproteins uh, through the dimethylation of lysine uh, 36 on histone 3. This alters the gene expression and increases the expression of oncogenes. And this brings us to our third name for this protein, which is MMSET uh, for multiple myeloma set domain. And so this protein was initially associated with um, about 15 to 20% of multiple myelomas that have this chromosomal translocation that results in a fusion transcript between the immunoglobulin heavy chain and NSD2. And so this causes overexpression of NSD2 in these cell lines. Uh, which you can see in this Western blot. So on the left-hand uh, part of the blot are uh, multiple myeloma cell lines that contain this chromosomal translocation. And you can see the increase in NSD2 expression. And as you would expect, based on my introduction, you can also see an increase in H3, K36 dimethylation uh, compared to the cell lines on the right that do not contain this uh, chromosomal translocation. So as you would expect, if you use shRNA to reduce the concentration of NSD2, you get a corresponding reduction in H3, K36 dimethylation. And that's also seen if you knock out NSD2 from the cell line. And then on the right side, you can see that, as you would expect, if you add NSD2 back into the cell line, you yet again uh, start to see this H3, K36 dimethylation. So NSD2 was initially uh, described uh, as a protein overexpressed in multiple myeloma cancers, but it was since that time reported to be associated with a variety of other human cancers, the overexpression of NSD2. But not only NSD2 overexpression has been associated with cancer, but also uh, point mutations that increase the catalytic activity of NSD2. And one such mutation is E1099K, uh, which was identified in myeloma and ALL. And you can see that that point mutation occurs in the set domain, the catalytic set domain of NSD2. And it's thought that it increases the association between the enzyme and the histone substrate. And if you look at the plot on the lower left side of the slide, you can see that the in vitro activity of this mutant NSD2 is higher than the corresponding wild type counterpart. And as you would expect, it results in increased levels of H3K36 dimethylation, as you can see in the Western blot, and increased transformation of multiple myeloma cell lines that express the E1099K mutation compared to wild type enzyme. So if you decrease the concentrations of the E1099K point mutant uh, using shRNAs, it results in a lower proliferation of cells that express this mutant enzyme compared to the wild type cells. It also reduces the amount of colony formation. And in subcutaneous xenograft models, it um, reduces the size of the tumor volume, the tumor volume um, in uh, ALL cells. So mass spec studies have demonstrated uh, increased H3K36 dimethylation in both multiple myeloma and ALL cell lines uh, that expresses 
mutant NSD2 compared to the wild type counterpart. And as you would expect based on the introduction, uh, this increased catalytic activity is associated with an alteration in gene expression compared to the wild type counterpart. So that's not the only point mutation that's been identified. Another one, T1150A was identified in mantle cell lymphoma. And it again is located at the catalytic site domain. And as you can see on the right, the in vitro activity of this mutant enzyme is uh, higher compared with the wild type counterpart. So in summary, NSC2 um, has been shown to act as a general oncoprotein in transformation assays, and its catalytic activity is required for its tumor genicity. Um, it promotes the expression of oncogenes, and many cancer types are associated with NSD2 overexpression, including many that I'm listing on this slide. There are clinically relevant NSD point mutations, which increase its catalytic activity that are also associated with cancer. So the therapeutic hypothesis is if we can identify small molecule inhibitors of NSD2, it would be beneficial for some cancer patients. However, NSD2 has been a very difficult enzyme to identify inhibitors of. And this has been published, for instance, in the study that I'm showing at, or the article that I'm showing at the bottom of the slide. But also um, in discussions with my colleagues that work in pharma, I'm aware that this is a very difficult target and that many pharma companies are working on this enzyme. So there are very few reports of inhibitors for NSD2, and I'm summarizing them on this slide. Uh, at the top left is LEMO6 that was discovered from virtual screening against an NSD2 homology model. And um, it was followed up in vitro and found to have a very weak potency of almost a millimolar. Uh, the mycotoxin ketosin is known as a nonspecific methyltransferase inhibitor. It inhibits all of the NSD enzymes and inhibits NSD2 at low micromolar concentrations. Um, the, SAM, the SAM analog uh, synfungin that's isolated from streptomyces is a fairly weak inhibitor of NSD2. And the antiparasitic drug called Sermin is known to inhibit NSD2, but it's also known as a pan inhibitor of methyltransferases. So none of these molecules uh, have the attributes of a high quality chemical probe, uh, for instance, such as a defined mechanism of action and selectivity towards NSD2. So this is what we would like to identify. I mentioned that NSD2 has been a very difficult target to identify inhibitors of, and this is partially because it requires whole nucleosomes as a substrate. And so some of the data on the slide demonstrate that at the left, you can see that um, native histones purified from HeLa, either in the context of nucleosomes or in the, uh, lacking the DNA, so in the context of octomers, are substrates for NSD2. Now, NSD2 uh, methylates histone 3 as expected in the context of nucleosomes. However, you see that the substrate specificity actually switches over uh, in the case of octomers that lack that DNA, uh, to histone 4, which is um, not, that's not really known to be physiologically relevant. So it seems that the physiologically relevant modification is to histone 3. So uh, NSC2 really needs to um, methylate nucleosomes. And this is actually confirmed using recombinant histones. You can see the same pattern uh, in the data shown in the middle, where um, NSC2 is methylating histone 3 in the context of nucleosomes, but histone 4 in the context of octomers. However, you can see that the activity is a bit lower uh, with recombinant histones, and it's thought that this is due to um, currently uncharacterized post-translational modifications that make um, the, new, the native histones a more, um, a more capable substrate for NSD2. And then the data on the right just show the selectivity of the antibody used for these studies if the lysine is mutated to alanine, you're no longer able to stain the H3K36 dimethylation. Now, several groups have reported that NSCs are not active against peptide substrates. And this has been somewhat of a hindrance to developing assays for high throughput screening. Of course, peptides are excellent substrates, particularly for high throughput screening assays. Um, our group has also uh, found that at least our wild type full length NSC2 is not active against um, the peptide substrates that we've examined. Um, I'm taking some text from the 
publication shown at the bottom that indicated that in addition to the lack of activity against peptide substrates, um, at least in 2014, there was also a lack of robust quantitative assays that could be used uh, for screening of NSDs to identify inhibitors. And fortunately, the situation there has changed, as I'll talk about uh, momentarily, but this had been a barrier for quite some time. So there are two relevant studies um, in the literature uh, for high throughput screening of NSD enzymes. The first one involves the catalytic set domain of NSD2 and utilizes a nucleosome substrate as a assay that used radio labeled SAM, and this was conducted in 384 well format. And these authors screened more than a thousand compounds from the Presswood Chemical Library at a single concentration of 25 micromolar, and they identified sermon as a hit. Now, a related um, report involved the NSD2's relative NSD1, again, a fragment of NSD1, and a histone octamer substrate. And they utilize a sensitive luminescence-based assay, and it was performed in 384 well format, and they screened more than 1,700 compounds of microsource spectrum collection, again, at a single concentration of 20 micromolar, and identified sermon as a hit. Okay, so we realized that we had to use native histones um, in the context of nucleosomes as a substrate uh, in order to identify inhibitors of NSD2. Um, but one of the things that we realized that we could contribute is that we have the ability at NCATS to miniaturize assays to 1536 well format. And that can really allow you to stretch the reagents that you have quite a bit further. For example, on the left part of the slide, I'm showing you a 96 well plate, a 384 well plate, and a 1536 well plate. And of course, they all have the same footprint, but in the space of a 96 well, you can see that in a 384 well plate, there are four wells, and a 1536 well plate would have 16 wells in that same space. So if you wanted to perform a titration of seven points with 50 microliter volumes, in 96 well format, it would require 350 microliters. However, you could perform that same experiment with only 28 microliters in a 1536 well format. So it really allows you to stretch uh, your use of the reagents. And I mentioned two relevant studies that utilized the 384 well format for screening. And if those authors wanted to screen 100,000 compounds, it would require 261 plates. Whereas if the same screen was conducted with the 1536 well format, it only requires 66 uh, microtiter plates. So one of the things that we did was to miniaturize the assay down to four microliters. Uh, the next thing is that we really were lucky that Promega had just released the methyl transferase glow assay. And that involves performing a methyl transferase reaction in solution. So in, in our case, it was full length wild type NSD2 with uh, nucleosomes purified from HeLa. And as you know, I described in the introduction, uh, in addition to methylating the nucleosomes, SAM is converted to SAW. And the way this detection technology works is that SAW is then through a two-step process, first converted to ADP, and then from ADP to ATP, and then luminescent light through a luciferase coupled reaction. So um, this is a very sensitive readout and had a number of advantages. Among the common detection technologies, you can see that uh, as I mentioned, luminescence is the most sensitive detection methodology. Um, also, luminescence is less susceptible to some types of compound-mediated um, interferences, as shown in the slide here. So, for instance, uh, compounds can reduce aggregation. Um, they can have component-specific uh, interferences, such as uh, unwanted activity due to chemical reactivity. They can um, have molecular mimicry that can interfere with an assay. And they can also, through autofluorescence properties or um, absorbance, they can interfere with luminescent readouts. And that's shown, uh, sorry, fluorescence readouts. So that's shown on the left. And work at our center demonstrated that if you're able to redshift your fluorescence-based assay, you can reduce the amount of interference of these library compounds. But with luminescence, you don't have that initial excitation energy. So you don't, uh, you have far less compounds uh, that are interfering due to that mechanism, although you can have 
compounds that are absorbing the luminescent light from the luciferase. So we have to be aware of that. And another source of assay interference is that these compounds could potentially inhibit the coupling enzymes that couple the saw product to the luminescent light. I'll come back to that one. Okay, so I mentioned two different assays that were reported in the literature, and they involved screening at a single concentration, single dose. And the question is, how do you know whether your assay is suitable for high throughput screening? And uh, historically, people used uh, different metrics to evaluate the performance of assays and suitability for high throughput screening, including metrics like signal to noise and signal to background. And I'm showing you two examples of assays on the left uh, with their high and low signals indicated by solid um, lines, the mean. And then you can see the data points are distributed as noise around the mean. And if I asked you which assay was better suited for high throughput screening to give you that confidence in screening single doses, um, and you use signal to noise or signal to background, you would prefer the assay on the bottom because it has a superior signal to background and signal to noise ratio. However, your eyes are probably telling you that the assay at the top is better, and you're right, because there's more separation between the high and low signals. So if you look at some of the data points that are near the threshold on the high signal on the bottom, assay, you can see that uh, they almost look like hits, but they're still in the range of noise. And um, whereas on the top, there's a lot more separation between these two populations, and so hits are easier to really have confidence in. And so this is indicated by the Z prime factor equation that's shown at the bottom right. And so basically, this takes into account three standard deviations around the high control and the low control. and gives you a sense of the separation between these two populations. And so in theory, a perfect assay would have a Z prime factor value of one, but in practice, an assay with a Z prime factor value of 0.5 or greater is considered to be an excellent assay. And an assay with the Z prime factor less than zero is basically impossible for screening. So we miniaturized our NST2 reaction down to four microliters and optimized it with the methyl transferase glow assay uh, using the full length wild type NSD2 enzyme and a nucleosome substrate and then evaluated the performance. And what we found was that it was excellent with a Z prime factor of 0.9 and a signal to background higher than three, as you can see on the left of this slide. One of the things that we have to be concerned about at NCADS is whether DMSO can interfere with the readout because all of our test compounds are delivered with DMSO as a vehicle. So we carried out a DMSO titration, as you can see in the middle, and showed that DMSO wasn't um, reducing our signal window. And then we also wanted to be sure that, uh, as you would expect, if you lower the concentration of the enzyme, you see a linear reduction in the signal, and that was the case. So given the excellent performance of this assay, we then optimized assays for the two clinically relevant mutants that I described in the introduction, E1099K and T1150A. And as you can see, uh, these assays were uh, very similar in their performance compared to the wild type enzyme with Z prime values close to 0.9 and signal in the background values of three. Okay, so this is the protocol sequence that we used for high throughput screening. Again, we miniaturized these assays down to four microliter volumes. We delivered test compounds as 23 nanoliter aliquots and the methyl transferase reaction proceeded for 15 minutes at room temperature before we initiated the detection steps. So on the left side of the slide is a schematic showing the high throughput screening facilities at NCATS. You can see that we have a variety of different um, plate readers, liquid handlers, uh, incubators, and carousels to hold uh, test compounds, and three robots that collectively are able to reach all the instrumentation throughout the platform. And so they coordinate the screens and can actually perform multiple high throughput screens at the same time, depending on the needs for the instrumentation. Now, one of the contributions of NCATS to the high throughput screening community is the introduction of quantitative high throughput screening, uh, which is when high throughput screening is performed uh, at a dose response format. And then this really allows us to make um, 
excellent decisions on which prioritizing hit compounds and which are the most attractive to follow up on. Because right out of the primary screen, we have information about potency, efficacy, sometimes information that might select uh, suggest that a certain compound is um, some type of an assay artifact. But the way that this is executed is um, pretty, pretty excellent for um, flexibility. So for instance, we have uh, all of the compounds at their different concentrations located on separate plates. So if you wanted to perform a high throughput screen at a single concentration, not only could you do that, you could decide which concentration you wanted to screen at. But if you wanted to screen in dose response format, you could choose the number of uh, titration points you wanted to use and the concentrations. So it really gives you a lot of flexibility. For this particular project, we uh, screened eight libraries, including the Library of Pharmacologically Active Compounds, or LOPAC, uh, the Presswick Chemical Library, the Microsource Collection, the TOCRIS Collection, an epigenetics focus collection that was developed in NCATS, a natural products library, and an, what's called an impact library, which contains a number of compounds with known mechanisms. And then the famous NCATS pharmaceutical collection, uh, which includes more than 2,800 compounds, about half of which are drugs approved in the US and uh, about a quarter of which are drugs approved in Canada, UK, Europe, and Japan. And then about a quarter of these compounds are investigational drugs uh, that were used in clinical trials. So this uh, image shows the high throughput screening facilities at NCATS. And again, we used the methyl transferase glow assay in order to screen 16,251 compounds at three doses. We chose 115 micromolar, 57 and a half micromolar, and 11.5 micromolar. And uh, the performance of the screen was excellent. Uh, among 43 1536 well plates, the average C prime factor value was 0.92, uh, which is actually very similar to the Z prime of the optimized assay. Our average signal to background ratio for the 43 plates was above three. And we use CMSO uh, control percent coefficient of variation as kind of an indicator of uh, variability in liquid handling. And we like this value to be below 10%. And as you can see, the average percent coefficient of variation was 1.7, which was excellent. And we had a 3.3% hit rate. So among the hits, we chose to follow up on 289 compounds as cherry picks. And uh, this figure shows the, on the left, the compound storage facility. It's a negative 20 freezer that contains robotics inside and can deliver the compounds to the window shown in the center. And then they're plated out at 11 point concentration uh, series so that we can follow up and not only um, confirm the activity of these hits, but also get a better uh, indication of their potencies and efficacies. So to do this, we utilize the methyl transferase glow assay again. And um, you can see the schematic for that shown on this slide. And 174 compounds were confirmed as hits. Uh, when we repeated this assay at 11 point dose response. So here are four of the hits, and it'll become clear why I'm introducing these four. They each have a different story. So this first compound was um, actually synthesized at NCATS, and I'll talk more about that soon. The second compound is known as DZNEP. It's a carboxylic analog of adenosine, and it's known as a global uh, histone methylation inhibitor. The, the compound on the lower left is ketosin, which I mentioned is a known inhibitor of NSD2. So we were delighted uh, that this showed up as a hit because it really validated our screening approach. And then this compound on the lower right is known as a CDC25 phosphatase inhibitor. It inhibits uh, the three CDC25 isoforms with nanomolar potencies. So this was not known to inhibit NSD2. The first thing that we wanted to do was ask whether any of these compounds were actually inhibiting the assay readout and may not actually have any genuine activity against the NSD2 enzyme. And in order to do this, we performed a counter screen where we added the concentration of SAW that we would expect in the uninhibited NSD2 reaction. And we incubated that SAW with 
test compounds, and then perform the detection readout and measure uh, luminescent light. So with the four compounds I introduced, uh, we saw the following. As you can see, the two compounds shown at the bottom uh, showed no apparent interference with the assay readout, but the two compounds shown at the top uh, appeared to inhibit the assay, and uh, the dose response curves pretty much overlapped uh, the initial observation, suggesting that maybe all of the activity that we're observing is due to interference with the um, primary assay. So we actually, um, the, the compound in the upper left was not a huge surprise. Uh, as I mentioned, this was synthesized at NCATS, and it was actually synthesized uh, to demonstrate that it inhibited firefly luciferase. So um, it contains in red, uh, the PTC-124 um, moiety, this was actually, a PTC-124 is a drug indicated for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and it was uh, developed by PTC Therapeutics, and it was identified with a firefly luciferase reporter assay. And um, so this was used in, in a nonsense codon suppression assay. And they identified PTC-124, and... Um, our group at NCATS demonstrated that this is a potent inhibitor of firefly luciferase. Uh, this compound was synthesized and shown to interact with the luciferase with a, a very high, uh, very strong affinity dissociation constant of 120 picomolar. And crystallographic studies uh, showed a direct interaction between this compound and firefly luciferase. But we still followed up on this finding, as you can see uh, with the data shown in the black circles, and um, as expected, this compound potently inhibited firefly luciferase. Um, and you might be wondering why there's such a shift in potency between uh, the firefly luciferase assay and our methyl transferase glow assay. And this is because even though the methyl transferase glow assay utilized a firefly luciferase enzyme, it was a genetically evolved version with a number of amino acid substitutions that made it more thermostable and less susceptible to inhibition by test compounds. So the acid was really intended to support high throughput screening. So that's why you can see the shift in potency. Now, uh, notably, the DZNEP compound that also interfered with this assay showed no evidence of interfering with firefly luciferase. So um, it's likely interfering with another one of the enzymes uh, that couple saw to luminescent light. So, the next question we had was, um, given we had confirmed the activity of 174 compounds, and then after performing the counter screen to identify compounds that also inhibited the primary assay, we had 137 compounds uh, that at least appeared at that point to be uh, selective towards NSD2. Uh, we were aware that many of these compound libraries were pharmacologically active and contained reactive compounds, so we performed an amplex red assay to identify compounds that are just reactive and might, uh, say, have an unwanted mechanism of inhibiting NSD2. So with the Amplex red assay, um, redox cycling compounds can interact with DTT to generate hydrogen peroxide, and then horseradish peroxidase is able to uh, convert Amplex red and hydrogen peroxide to resolufin that can be measured in a plate reader by reading fluorescence. Now, you might recognize this compound shown at the top right part of the slide as uh, the fourth compound I introduced to you as a hit from the high throughput screen. And in fact, Johnston and colleagues in 2008 reported this as a very reactive compound. Here are their data, and their data match our findings with our Amplex Red uh, assay, which are shown in uh, red squares. And you can see that for the DA3003 molecule, the potency of this reactivity uh, mirrors the potency of the NSD2 inhibition, suggesting that um, probably uh, the mechanism is due to the reactivity of this compound. Uh, none of the other compounds uh, showed any evidence of undergoing redox cycling. So at this point, we really wanted to gain additional evidence for on-target activity uh, that these compounds are actually inhibiting the activity of NSD2. So we turned to an orthogonal assay approach. We utilized time-resolved uh, forced resonance energy transfer, uh, TR-FRET. And this is very similar to standard FRET, where 
uh, it's a proximity-based assay uh, where with when um, the two components are within 20 nanometers proximity, there could be a non-radiative energy transfer between the donor and acceptor, and you can measure a fret signal. In this case, the donor is a lanthanide that can have a long emission uh, lifetime up to a, a millisecond. And this is really well suited for high throughput screening because often there are sources of unwanted fluorescence following the excitation, uh, including like proteins and compounds and serum. And so this unwanted fluorescence drops off quickly, but the um, long emission time of the lanthanide allows you to measure that time resolved fret signal later on uh, after that unwanted fluorescence has decayed. And additionally, it's possible to measure not only the time resolved fret signal, but the donor emission, uh, which can sometimes indicate compounds that are interfering with your assay. So the way this assay was set up is that there was an anti saw cryptate, so uh, antibody containing the lanthanide, and then it binds to a, a labeled saw, uh, enabling a high fret signal. Uh, to be read in the absence of any methyltransferase activity. So as the methyltransferase uh, reaction is proceeding, unlabeled saw then goes and displaces the labeled form of the saw, uh, resulting in a reduced HTRF signal. So you can see the optimized assay shown on the right uh, with the full reaction, as you would expect, having a lower signal compared to the new enzyme control. And you can see that the overall assay parameters are very similar to the methyl transferase glow acid that we optimized with the Z prime close to 0.9 and a signal to background above three. So we did verify that this assay um, is tolerant to DMSO by conducting a DMSO titration, as you can see in this slide. And then we proceeded to evaluate the 104 hits uh, that were confirmed with the primary assay, uh, did not interfere with that assay, uh, we did not find any evidence that they were redox cycling compounds. And of these 104 compounds that we had at that point, we confirmed the activity of 48 compounds. And so what happened with the four compounds that I introduced to you? Well, it turns out that there was no evidence for inhibition of NSD2 by the two compounds shown at the top, okay? But the, both uh, ketosin and DA3003 did show evidence of inhibiting NSD2. So at this point, we wanted to evaluate the activity of these um, 40 remaining compounds against the two clinically relevant mutants that we had developed assays for. Um, again, the methyl transferase glow assay. So we first screened um, these 40 heads against the E1099K point mutation. And you can see uh, that 45 of the 48 heads also, um, also inhibited that mutant. Uh, including these two shown here at the bottom, ketosin and DA3003, uh, as shown in uh, the purple triangles. And then we evaluated the T1150A mutation, and we found that 44 of the 48 NSD2 wild type inhibitor uh, compounds also inhibited uh, this mutant. And you can see that the potencies of both ketosin and DA3003 against the two mutants uh, essentially overlapped. Okay, so um, ultimately we decided to follow up on five compounds and two of them I've already described to you. Uh, ketosin we decided to continue to follow because it was a known NSD2 inhibitor. And so we wanted to keep it as a positive control. The other compound DA3003, uh, we thought its activity was due to uh, chemical reactivity, was, which is a non-desirable mechanism, uh, but we still wanted to continue to see how it performed in our downstream assays. The other three compounds I've not described to you yet, and they include the ABT199, or venetoclax, that's known to bind BCL2 with certain animal or affinities, and it's been approved by the FDA for treatment of CLL. Uh, this compound called TCLPA54 was reported by Sanofi as a selective LPA5 receptor antagonist. And this Pfizer compound is known as a highly potent mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. So the first thing we wanted to do was, uh, now that we had two different activity assays suggesting that these compounds interacted with and inhibited NSD2, uh, we wanted to really 
carefully measure uh, their activity against NSD2. So we chose uh, the most sensitive and, and um, kind of gold standard assay uh, we're aware of, which is a radio labeled SAM assay. And uh, that's has the sensitivity of, of the radio label, but it also is uh, a direct measure of the nucleosome product, uh, the methylated product. So uh, this is an excellent assay. And as you can see from our data, all five of these compounds uh, inhibited NSD2 according to this assay readout as well. So now we have three orthogonal readouts of activity, all indicating that these compounds are able to inhibit NSD2. And at the bottom right, you can see that we used SAW as a control that's known to inhibit NSD2 uh, at around eight micromolar. So this table summarizes the data thus far. And um, you can see that the potencies of uh, all five compounds were very similar with that methyltransferase flow assay uh, between the wild type and mutant enzymes. For reasons we don't understand, DA3003 and ketosin uh, seem to be much less potent against NSD2 according to the HTRF assay. And then again, for reasons we don't understand, the radio labeled activity assay indicated that um, all five compounds were substantially more potent inhibitors of NSD2 than either of the first two assays suggested. However, um, this is, as I said, the most sensitive readout of activity and also a direct measure of the methylated nucleosome product. And so we repeated these studies a number of times, and I would say that we have most confidence in these numbers. So given that we had three different assays uh, suggesting that these compounds were able to inhibit NSD2, we wanted to ask the question of whether they're able to bind to the catalytic subdomain as we would expect. And so we performed surface plasmid resonance experiments. And this is our controls, both SAW and SAM bound the catalytic set domain of NSC2 as expected. Um, so it turns out that all five of our follow-up compounds also bound to the uh, set domain of NSC2, as you can see, uh, with these uh, dissociation constant values on the right. Um, I wanna highlight that for the compounds bound stoichiometrically, so one inhibitor to one catalytic set domain, ketosin bound super stoichiometrically. So there were multiple ketosin molecules uh, per set domain. And this was actually expected based on literature that indicates that the um, uh, disulfide binds of ketosin can form covalent addicts onto proteins. And we suspect that this is actually the mechanism of inhibition of ketosin for NSC2. It's forming these covalent addicts and, uh, and interfering with its activity. Okay, so it's also interesting to consider uh, the affinities of these compounds to the set domain and how closely they compare to the activities that we determined using the radio labeled assay, as I'm showing on the far right. Uh, you can see that these are often within two or three fold um, activity IC50 values uh, compared to the uh, dissociation constant. So at this point, uh, we felt confident that these compounds uh, by three different assays were inhibiting NSD2, they were binding the catalytic set domain, and we wanted to ask, um, were they selective for NSD2? And so we profiled 38 uh, methyltransferases, and on the first column on the left, I'm showing you the name of the methyltransferase. In the next column, I'm showing you the substrate. And then the next five columns are uh, each inhibitor and I'm indicating um, the activity in micromolar units, and I'm coloring these cells as a heat map with green indicating very potent inhibition, red indicating very weak inhibition, and then white uh, indicating no inhibition observed. And what you can see is that the most potent and least selective compound was DA3003, and it's pretty striking when you compare that to Ketosin, which is known as a uni universal methyltransferase inhibitor, you can see that DA3003 is quite a bit more universal. Um, I would say that the most um, selective inhibitor here is the Pfizer compound, but it's not selective for NSD2. It seems somewhat uh, selective for several other methyltransferases. Um, so none of these compounds are selective towards NSD2. 
But nevertheless, we had demonstrated uh, that they could inhibit NSC2 activity and they bound the catalytic set domain. So we wanted to ask the question of whether we could find evidence that they were inhibiting NSC2 in cells. And so we utilized the U2 OS osteosarcoma cells uh, and it had been previously reported that if you use siRNA to knock down the concentrations of NSD2, you get, as expected, a reduction in H3K36 dimethylation. So uh, we wanted to apply our compounds to these cells and see if the levels of H3K36 dimethylation dropped. And uh, that assay is shown here. Um, at the top of the Western, on the left side of the slide, you can see that we use TZNEP as a control. Uh, our collaborators at Reaction Biology who performed these experiments uh, had experience with the cell line and were aware that DZNEP would be an excellent control for H3K36 dimethylation inhibition. And uh, we measured densitometry here and plotted it on the right in the black circles. You can see that um, we estimated a potency of 390 nanomolar. Now, we don't think that that's due to inhibition of NSD2 because I had showed you that in vitro activity uh, data that indicated that this is not able to inhibit NSD2. So it must be by some other mechanism. Uh, another thing that we noticed in conducting these studies was that all of these compounds, to some extent, at least at the highest concentrations, uh, were toxic to cells. And so we performed uh, proliferation assays shown uh, at the right side of the slide in the bottom over 96 hours. And you can see um, we use bortezomib as a control. Um, there's various amounts of toxicity at different concentrations. Uh, on the left side of the slide, you can see that we're blotting H3K36 dimethylation and uh, total histone 3. And you can see some reductions in H3K36 dimethylation, but we, we didn't want to consider uh, conditions where we knew there was also cytotoxicity because it could confound our data. So if we only considered conditions where there's no evidence of toxicity for these compounds, I would say that the only compound uh, that suggested some dose-dependent decreases in H3K36 dimethylation was the Pfizer compound, which is shown uh, with the green triangles on the top uh, with a apparent potency of about 3.2 micromolar. Now, it's unclear whether that's due to NSD2 or not because the profiling data also indicated that it can inhibit a variety of different enzymes. So in summary, NSD2 is a well-established target for cancer therapeutics, um, but it's been a very difficult target. And so far, no one has reported a uh, high-throughput screen using full-length wild-type NSD2 and a nucleosome substrate. So we were able to utilize the methyltransferase glow luminescence assay to screen 16,251 compounds at three doses and identified a number of hits. We followed up by 289 of those hits and confirmed activities of some in 11 point dose response uh, format. We then uh, confirmed active compounds. We interrogated them with a variety of counter and orthogonal assays, including the gold standard uh, radio label assay. And we followed up on the activity of five inhibitors um, and confirmed their interaction with the catalytic set domain using surface plasmid resonance. And we evaluated the selectivity of these five inhibitors and showed that none of them were selective towards NSD2. Um, however, the Pfizer compound showed uh, some hint of activity in cell-based assays, but it's unclear yet whether that's due to inhibition of NSD2 or another enzyme, like in the case of TZNAP. But I think what we really did here was we developed a very nice workflow for the identification of selective NSD2 inhibitors, and we need to screen um, different chemical libraries. And so that's currently the plan. Uh, we're currently seeking funding to perform a large high-throughput screen using some of the other uh, library collections that we have. And in the meantime, we're currently performing structural studies of NSD2 and complex with substrates and some of the inhibitors we identified. And we plan to perform in silico screening, identify uh, in silico hits among compounds in our own libraries in-house, and then follow up on these hits using a... Um, in vitro assays. I want to acknowledge a number of colleagues who contributed to these studies, including my colleagues at Reaction Biology and NCATS, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr.
Dr. Cousins for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on the screen, and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, you perform the high throughput screen the high throughput screen using full length wild type NSD2. Could you have carried out the screen with one of the mutant enzymes instead? Yes, great question. So we did perform the screen with the wild type NSD2 enzyme, um, but I showed you the data that indicated that um, the assay performance with the two mutant enzymes uh, was very similar and we were able to obtain the mutant enzymes in sufficient quantity for high throughput screening. Actually, one of the, um, I mentioned that we are currently seeking funding to perform a larger screen, and we are actually considering using the E1099K point mutant uh, for the screen instead of wild type NSD2. Our next question is, what was the assay used to measure activities for the methyl transferase profiling studies? Okay. So all of these as uh, all of the methyl transferase profiling work was done with a radio labeled assay. And Dr. Cousins, it looks like we have time for one more question. You use nucleosomes extracted from the HeLa cells as a substrate, but there could be heterogeneity from pre-existing modifications. Would it have been better to use homogeneous recombinant nucleosomes assembled from purified histones? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And we thought uh, about that question pretty hard. Obviously, uh, the advantage of having defined substrates um, is that you have a lot more knowledge about um, you know, what's going into the assay. But ultimately, we felt that uh, the nucleosomes purified from HeLa were more physiologically relevant substrate. And I showed you that data that indicates NSD2 is more active against native histones purified from HeLa. So we really felt that that was ultimately the better way to go. Thanks for the question. I would like to once again thank Dr. Cousins for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.